through the carrion caves. Straight toward the north, day and night, our destination compass led us after the fleeing flyer, upon which it had remained set since I first attuned it after leaving the Thurn Fortress. Early in the second night we noticed the air becoming perceptibly colder, and from the distance we had come from the equator we were assured that we were rapidly approaching the North Arctic region. My knowledge of the efforts that had been made by countless expeditions to explore that unknown land bade me to caution, for never had Flyer returned who had passed to any considerable distance beyond the mighty ice barrier that fringes the southern hem of the frigid zone. What became of them none knew, only that they passed forever out of the sight of man into that grim and mysterious country of the Pole. The distance from the barrier to the Pole was no more than a swift flyer could cover in a few hours, and so it was assumed that some frightful catastrophe awaited those who reached the Forbidden Land, as it had come to be called by the Martians of the Outer World. Thus it was that I went more slowly as we approached the barrier, for it was my intention to move cautiously by day over the ice pack that I might discover before I had run into a trap if there really lay an inhabited country at the North Pole, for there only could I imagine a spot where Matai Shang might feel secure from John Carter, Prince of Helia. We were flying at a snail's pace, but a few feet above the ground, literally feeling our way along through the darkness. For both moons had set, and the night was black with the clouds that are to be found only at Mars's two extremities. Suddenly a towering wall of white rose directly in our path, and though I threw the helm hard over and reversed our engine, I was too late to avoid collision. With a sickening crash we struck the high looming obstacle three-quarters on. The flyer reeled half over. The engine stopped. As one, the patched buoyancy tanks burst, and we plunged head foremost to the ground twenty feet beneath. Fortunately, none of us was injured, and when we had disentangled ourselves from the wreckage, and the lesser moon had burst again from below the horizon, we found that we were at the foot of a mighty ice barrier, from which outcropped great patches of the granite hills which hold it from encroaching farther toward the south. What fate! With the journey all but completed, to be thus wrecked upon the wrong side of that precipitous and unscalable wall of rock and ice. I looked to Thieu von Din. He but shook his head dejectedly. The balance of the night we spent shivering in our inadequate sleeping silks and furs upon the snow that lies at the foot of the ice barrier. With daylight my battered spirits regained something of their accustomed hopefulness, though I must admit that there was little enough for them to feed upon. "'What shall we do?' asked Duvandin. "'How may we pass that which is impassable?' First, we must disprove its impassibility,' I replied. "'Nor shall I admit that it is impassable before I have followed its entire circle.' and stand again upon this spot, defeated. The sooner we start, the better, for I see no other way, and it will take us more than a month to travel the weary, frigid miles that lie before us. For five days of cold and suffering and privation, we traversed the rough and frozen way that lies at the foot of the ice barrier. Fierce, fur-bearing creatures attacked us by daylight and by dark, Never for a moment were we safe from the sudden charge of some huge demon of the north. The apt was our most consistent and dangerous foe. It is a huge, white-furred creature with six limbs, four of which, short and heavy, carry it swiftly over the snow and ice, while the other two, growing forward from its shoulders on either side of its long, powerful neck, terminate in white, hairless hands, with which it seizes and holds its prey. Its head and mouth are more similar in appearance to those of a hippopotamus 
than to any other earthly animal except that from the sides of the lower jawbone two mighty horns curve slightly downward toward the front its two huge eyes inspired my greatest curiosity they extend in two vast oval patches from the center of the top of the cranium down either side of the head to below the roots of the horns so that these weapons really grow out from the lower part of the eyes which are composed of several thousand ocelli each this eye structure seemed remarkable in a beast whose haunts were upon a glaring field of ice and snow and though i found upon minute examination of several that we killed that each ocellus is furnished with its own lid and that the animal can at will close as many of the facets of his huge eyes as he chooses yet i was positive that nature had thus equipped him because much of his life was to be spent in dark subterranean recesses shortly after this we came upon the hugest ant that we had seen the creature stood fully eight feet at the shoulder and was so sleek and clean and glossy that i could have sworn that he had but recently been groomed he stood head on eyeing us as we approached him for we had found it a waste of time to attempt to escape the perpetual bestial rage which seems to possess these demon creatures who rove the dismal north attacking every living thing that comes within the scope of their far-seeing eyes even when their bellies are full and they can eat no more they kill purely for the pleasure which they derive from taking life and so when this particular apt failed to charge us and instead wheeled and trotted away as we neared him i should have been greatly surprised had i not chanced to glimpse the sheen of a golden collar about its neck Thuvan din saw it too and it carried the same message of hope to us both only man could have placed that collar there and as no race of martians of which we knew aught ever had attempted to domesticate the ferocious apt he must belong to a people of the north of whose very existence we were ignorant possibly to the fabled yellow men of barzoom that once powerful race which was supposed to be extinct though sometimes by theorists thought still to exist in the frozen north simultaneously we started upon the trail of the great beast Ula was quickly made to understand our desires so that it was unnecessary to attempt to keep in sight of the animal whose swift flight over the rough ground soon put him beyond our vision for the better part of two hours the trail paralleled the barrier and then suddenly turned toward it through the roughest and seemingly most impassable country i ever had beheld enormous granite boulders blocked the way on every hand deep rifts in the ice threatened to engulf us at the least misstep and from the north a slight breeze wafted to our nostrils an unspeakable stench that almost choked us for another two hours we were occupied in traversing a few hundred yards to the foot of the barrier then turning about the corner of a wall-like outcropping of granite we came upon a smooth area of two or three acres before the base of the towering pile of ice and rock that had baffled us for days and before us beheld the dark and cavernous mouth of a cave from this repelling portal the, the horrid stench was emanating and as Thuvan din espied the place he halted with an exclamation of profound astonishment by all my ancestors he ejaculated that i should have lived to witness the reality of the fabled carrion caves if these indeed be they we have found a way beyond the ice barrier the ancient chronicles of the first historians of barsoom so ancient that we have for ages considered the mythology record the passing of the yellow men from the ravages of the green hordes that overran barsoom 
as the drying up of the great oceans drove the dominant races from their strongholds. They tell of the wanderings of the remnants of this once powerful race, harassed at every step, until at last they found a way through the ice barrier of the north to a fertile valley at the pole. At the opening to the subterranean passage that led to their haven of refuge, a mighty battle was fought, in which the yellow men were victorious, and within the caves that gave ingress to their new home, they piled the bodies of the dead, both yellow and green, that the stench might warn away their enemies from further pursuit. And ever since that long-gone day have the dead of this fabled land been carried to the carrion caves, that in death and decay they might serve their country, and warn away invading enemies. Here, too, is brought, so the fable runs, all the waste stuff of the nation, everything that is subject to rot, and that can add to the foul stench that assails our nostrils. And death lurks at every step among rotting dead, for here the fierce apts lair, adding to the putrid accumulation with the fragments of their own prey which they cannot devour. It is a horrid avenue to our goal, but it is the only one. You are sure, then, that we have found the way to the land of the yellow men? I cried. As sure as may be, he replied, having only ancient legend to support my belief. But see how closely so far each detail tallies with the old world story of the Hegira of the yellow race. Yes, I am sure that we have discovered the way to their ancient hiding place. If it be true, and let us pray that such may be the case, I said, then here may we solve the mystery of the disappearance of Tartar's moors, Jeddak of Helium, and Moors Kajak his son, for no other spot upon Barsoom has remained unexplored by the many expeditions and the countless spies that have been searching for them for nearly two years. The last word that came from them was that they sought Carthoris, my own brave son, beyond the ice barrier. As we talked, we had been approaching the entrance to the cave, and as we crossed the threshold, I ceased to wonder that the ancient green enemies of the yellow men had been halted by the horrors of that awful way. The bones of dead men lay man-high upon the broad floor of the first cave, and over all was a putrid mush of decaying flesh, through which the apts had beaten a hideous trail toward the entrance to the second cave beyond. The roof of this first apartment was low, like all that we traversed subsequently so that the foul odors were confined and condensed to such an extent that they seemed to possess tangible substance. One was almost tempted to draw his short sword and hew his way through in search of pure air beyond. Can man breathe this polluted air and live? asked Yuvan Din, choking. Not for long, I imagine, I replied. So let us make haste. I will go first, and you bring up the rear, with Wula between. Come. And with the words I dashed forward across the fetid mass of putrefaction. It was not until we had passed through seven caves of different sizes and varying but little in the power and quality of their stenches that we met with any physical opposition. Then, within the eighth cave, we came upon a lair of apts. A full score of the mighty beasts were disposed about the chamber. Some were sleeping, while others tore at the fresh-killed carcasses of new-brought prey, or fought among themselves in their love-making. Here, in the dim light of their subterranean home, the value of their great eyes was apparent. For these inner caves are shrouded in perpetual gloom that is but little less than utter darkness. To attempt to pass through the midst of that fierce herd seemed even to me the height of folly, and so I proposed to Thuvan Din that he return to the outer world with Ula, that the two might find their way to civilization 
and come again with a sufficient force to overcome not only the apts, but any further obstacles that might lie between us and our goal. In the meantime, I continued, I may discover some means of winning my way alone to the land of the yellow men, but if I am unsuccessful, one life only will have been sacrificed. Should we all go on and perish, there will be none to guide a succoring party to Dejathoris and your daughter. I shall not return and leave you here alone, John Carter, replied Thivon Din. Whether you go on to victory or death, the Jeddak of Tarth remains at your side. I have spoken. I knew from his tone that it were useless to attempt to argue the question, and so I compromised by sending Woola back with a hastily penned note enclosed in a small metal case and fastened about his neck. I commanded the faithful creature to seek Carthoris at Helium, and though half a world and countless dangers lay between, I knew that if the thing could be done, Woola would do it. Equipped as he was by nature, with marvellous speed and endurance, and with frightful ferocity which made him a match for any single enemy of the way, his keen intelligence and wondrous instinct should easily furnish all else that was needed for the successful accomplishment of his mission. It was with evident reluctance that the great beast turned to leave me, in compliance with my command, and ere he had gone, I could not resist the inclination to throw my arms about his great neck in a parting hug. He rubbed his cheek against mine in a final caress, and a moment later was speeding through the carrion caves toward the outer world. In my note to Carthoris I had given explicit directions for locating the carrion caves, impressing upon him the necessity for making entrance to the country beyond through this avenue, and not to attempt under any circumstances to cross the ice barrier with the fleet. I told him that what lay beyond the eighth cave I could not even guess, but I was sure that somewhere upon the other side of the ice barrier his mother lay in the power of Matai Shang, and that possibly his grandfather and great-grandfather as well, if they lived. Further, I advised him to call upon Fulan Tith and the son of Thuvan Din for warriors and ships, that the expedition might be sufficiently strong to ensure success at the first blow. And, I concluded, if there be time, bring Tars Tarkas with you, for if I live until you reach me, I can think of few greater pleasures than to fight once more shoulder to shoulder with my old friend. When Woola had left us, Thuvan Din and I, hiding in the seventh cave, discussed and discarded many plans for crossing the eighth chamber. From where we stood we saw that the fighting among the apts was growing less, and that many that had been feeding had ceased and lain down to sleep. Presently it became apparent that in a short time all the ferocious monsters might be peacefully slumbering and thus a hazardous opportunity be presented to us to cross through the lair. One by one the remaining brutes stretched themselves upon the bubbling decomposition that covered the mass of bones upon the floor of their den, until but a single apt remained awake. This huge fellow roamed restlessly about, nosing among his companions and the abhorrent litter of the cave. Occasionally he would stop to peer intently toward first one of the exits from the chamber and then the other. His whole demeanor was as of one who acts as sentry. We were at last forced to the belief that he would not sleep while the other occupants of the lair slept, and so cast about in our minds for some scheme whereby we might trick him. Finally I suggested a plan to the Van Din and as it seemed as good as any that we had discussed, we decided to put it to the test. To this end, Thuvan Din placed himself close against the cave's wall, beside the entrance to the eighth chamber, 
while I deliberately showed myself to the guardian apt as he looked toward our retreat. Then I sprang to the opposite side of the entrance, flattening my body close to the wall. Without a sound, the great beast moved rapidly toward the seventh cave to see what manner of intruder had thus rashly penetrated so far within the precincts of his habitation. As he poked his head through the narrow aperture that connects the two caves, a heavy longsword was awaiting him on either hand, and before he had an opportunity to emit even a single growl, his severed head rolled about feet. Quickly we glanced into the eighth chamber. Not an apt had moved. Crawling over the carcass of the huge beast that blocked the doorway, Thuvon Din and I cautiously entered the forbidding and dangerous den. Like snails, we wound our silent and careful way among the huge recumbent forms. The only sound above our breathing was the sucking noise of our feet as we lifted them from the ooze of decaying flesh through which we crept. Halfway across the chamber, and one of the mighty beasts directly before me moved restlessly, at the very instant that my foot was poised above his head, over which I must step. Breathlessly I waited, balancing upon one foot, for I did not dare move a muscle. In my right hand was my keen short sword, the point hovering an inch above the thick fur beneath which beat the savage heart. Finally the apt relaxed, sighing, as with the passing of a bad dream, and resumed the regular respiration of deep slumber. I planted my raised foot beyond the fierce head, and an instant later had stepped over the beast. Yuvan Din followed directly after me, and another moment found us at the further door, undetected. The Carrion Caves consist of a series of twenty-seven connecting chambers, and present the appearance of having been eroded by running water in some far-gone age when a mighty river found its way to the south, through this single breach in the barrier of rock and ice that hems the country of the pole. Thuvan Din and I traversed the remaining nineteen caverns without adventure or mishap. We were afterward to learn that but once a month is it possible to find all the apts of the carrion caves in a single chamber. At other times they roam singly or in pairs in and out of the caves, so that it would have been practically impossible for two men to have passed through the entire twenty-seven chambers without encountering an apt in nearly every one of them. Once a month they sleep for a full day, and it was our good fortune to stumble by accident upon one of these occasions. Beyond the last cave we emerged into a desolate country of snow and ice, but found a well-marked trail leading north. The way was boulder-strewn, as had been that south of the barrier, so that we could see but a short distance ahead of us at any time. After a couple of hours we passed round a huge boulder to come to a steep declivity leading down into a valley. Directly before us we saw a half-dozen men, fierce, black-bearded fellows with skins the color of a ripe lemon. The yellow men of Barsoom, ejaculated Thuvan Din, as though even now that he saw them he found it scarce possible to believe that the very race we expected to find hidden in this remote and inaccessible land did really exist. We withdrew behind an adjacent boulder to watch the actions of the little party, which stood huddled at the foot of another huge rock, their backs toward us. One of them was peering round the edge of the granite mass, as though watching one who approached from the opposite side. Presently the object of his scrutiny came within the range of my vision, and I saw that it was another yellow man. All were clothed in magnificent furs, the six in the yellow and black striped hide of the orlock, while he who approached alone was resplendent in the pure white skin of an apt. The yellow men were armed with two swords, 
and a short javelin was slung across the back of each, while from their left arms hung cup-like shields no larger than a dinner plate, the concave sides of which turned outward toward an antagonist. They seemed puny and futile implements of safety against an even ordinary swordsman, but I was later to see the purpose of them, and with what wondrous dexterity the yellow men manipulate them. One of the swords, which each of the warriors carried, caught my immediate attention. I, I call it a sword, but really it was a sharp-edged blade with a complete hook at the far end. The other sword was about the same length as the hooked instrument, and somewhere between that of my long sword and my short sword. It was straight and two-edged. In addition to the weapons I have enumerated, each man carried a dagger in his harness. As the white-furred one approached, the six grasped their swords more firmly, the hooked instrument in the left hand, the straight sword in the right while above the left wrist the small shield was held rigid upon a metal bracelet. As the lone warrior came opposite them, the six rushed out upon him with fiendish yells that resembled nothing more closely than the savage war-cry of the Apaches of the southwest. Instantly the attacked drew both his swords, and as the six fell upon him, I witnessed as pretty fighting as one might care to see. With their sharp hooks the combatants attempted to take hold of an adversary, but like lightning the cup-shaped shield would spring before the darting weapon, and into its hollow the hook would plunge. Once the lone warrior caught an antagonist in the side with his hook, and drawing him close, ran his sword through him. But the odds were too unequal, and though he who fought alone was by far the best and bravest of them all, I saw that it was but a question of time before the remaining five would find an opening through his marvellous guard and bring him down. Now my sympathies have ever been with the weaker side of an argument, and though I knew nothing of the cause of the trouble, I could not stand idly by and see a brave man butchered by superior numbers. As a matter of fact, I presume I gave little attention to seeking an excuse, for I love a good fight too well to need any other reason for joining in when one is afoot. So it was that before Thuvandin knew what I was about, he saw me standing by the side of the white-clad yellow man, battling like mad with his five adversaries. End of chapter 8 Recording by Thomas Copeland